Since I went ahead and moved this one speaker, I figured I'd be not standing in one place tonight, and I didn't want to trip over it. <laughs> but if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke, Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. As you're turning there, I'll go ahead and get my introduction out of the way. How many of y'all ever made an excuse not to do something or go somewhere? <laughs> Boy, the last everybody has. I even made excuses. And uh, I was on a job one time uh, up on Route 50, uh, close to West Union at the Mark West Gas Plant. Anybody ever know where that's at? And, and, and when I was up there working to help building some of that for a year or two, one, one winter I was in there, it was about January, February, somewhere in there. Oh, my lands, it snowed and it was cold. On that little old flat plane there, that wind just kept blowing and it would cut through you like a knife. And I thought, my lands, I would feel good. I don't want to be in this. I can't, I can't handle this. So. It got to the point that I was regret, regretting to go to work. You ever regretted to go to work? Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was the only one that did that. But called my wife up and I told her, I said, honey, I ain't really doing too good. I said, it's cold. I'm miserable. She said, well, fly works. Come home. I'm on my way. <laughs> well, they was having a layoff that Friday and volunteer layoff. And we've had our, they all put us in this track, in a trailer, tractor trailer, trailer, and where we would eat our lunch and all that. And they had a little heater in there. And, and anyway, uh, we was eating lunch and that afternoon was the layoff day. And they was wondering who all was getting laid off. I said, I'm getting laid off. Why? I said, because my wife didn't say I had to be here. <laughs> One of the guys that I'm sitting with said, I wish my wife was saying that to me. <laughs> but I, I used her an excuse to go home. And I mean, it was good. But we've all used excuses in our lives to get out of things and not to uh, do things. And, and we're all guilty of this. But sometimes the excuses, there are legitimate excuses. I'm not going to preach on legitimate excuses tonight. What I'm going to preach on is the false excuses. And so many people have excuses, make so many excuses uh, for, for church members. They make every excuse under the book why they just can't go to church. <coughs> Ain't that true? Yeah. My toe hurts. My ear hurts. My wife is sick. My child is sick, and all of us got to stay home to blow his nose. <laughs> and another terrible excuse is not receiving Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. So many excuses come. I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm just going to read a couple of verses. I'll pray, and I'll get into the message. Uh, Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him, heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, which is Jesus, A certain man did a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them, They were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one accord began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs to go see it. Pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I have to go prove them. I have pray thee, have me excused. And then another said, I have buried a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for the events that happened down through tonight. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the singing, Heavenly Father, just singing from the heart, Heavenly Father. Lord, we just, I just want to thank you for the, the, the testimonies that has been given tonight. 
Heavenly Father, I ask you to give, give each and every one a blessing. Tonight, Heavenly Father, as I preach, Heavenly Father, Lord, just give me the words that you would have me to say. And Heavenly Father, thou knowest I'm nothing but a piece of dirt. And, and I'm just not worthy, Heavenly Father, but Lord, just give me, give me the words that you would have me to say tonight. And not only me, Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you to be with the hearers tonight. Be with them, pray that they will listen attentively. And I pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I ask you these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Here in verses 16 and 17, I'm going to go through this some, but here in verses 16 and 17, uh, it says, Then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. In other words, he invited many. He invited a lot of people. And in verse 17, And sent his servant at supper time to say to them, That were bidden, Come for all things is ready. He said, the food's prepared. Everything's ready. Come. Come now. Here God has issued an invitation. God has been issuing an invitation since, since man had been put on this earth. In Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 it says, Ho everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy, eat. Yea, come, buy. Wine and milk without money and without price. It is free. This invitation to this banquet, this invitation to this dinner, this invitation to the supper, it is a free invitation. All you have to do is come. All you have to do is receive it. And listen, we don't have to work for it. We do not have to buy it. We do not have to pay for it. It has already been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says this, For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why salvation is free. If we was able to work for our salvation, God, Jesus would not have had to die on the cross. Listen, that doesn't make a bit of difference. We cannot Please, God. We cannot earn brownie points. How many of y'all ever tried to earn brownie points with your boss? Huh? Everybody has. Don't shake your head. No. Everybody's earned. Listen, you will never earn brownie points with God Almighty. It does not work that way. The Bible says he is a respecter of what? Of no person. Of no person. God had already sent his son to die on the cross. He paid the price for our salvation. He paid, the pr he paid the price and prepared everything for the supper that, it, that believers will enjoy one day. In verses 18 through 20, we see the excuses <coughs> that has been offered up. And here in verse 18, uh, in, in verse uh, 18, he says, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. Here the first one. He said, the first one said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go see it. I pray thee have me excused. Let me ask you this question. When you bought a piece of property in your lifetime, did you ever buy it without going to look at it? Uh-huh. If you do, I got some motion front property in West Virginia. I'll sell you at a high price. All right? Listen. They didn't say, I don't want to come. They did not say that I will not come or I cannot come. But they just said, Please have me excused. I just can't do it. And they offered excuses. And offered excuses. My wife tells me to go do laundry and I give her an excuse why I can't do that. <laughs> Listen. What is an excuse? This, the, uh, let me give you this definition. An excuse, a frivolous excuse, is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. Stuffed with a lie. 
But I'm, I'm, Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, talking about having things. And he used his property and things as an excuse not to go to that supper. Many today uses their job as an excuse why they can't come to church. Many uses their job. And there's some people that has to work on Sunday. I understand that. The Lord understands that. But listen, if you make an excuse, if you use it as a frivolous excuse, that doesn't count with God. You'll have to have, you'll have to answer for that. And uh, man always makes excuses over things. And, and they use the property, the business, the things like this as an excuse. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26 says this. For what is man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You know you can work yourself and just buy and buy and buy and it's not going to bring you happiness. So many people are so so many people today is so materialistic minded they don't have time for Jesus Christ. They don't have time to go to the worship service because of return. And listen, recreational things falls right along in this. I had some people tell me I can't come to church because I'm going horseback ride. I ain't going to tell you all what I prayed about. Yeah, I will tell you. I told so many people this, y'all probably heard it before. I told them y'all go right ahead. You go on your horseback ride Sunday. And I will pray to the Father that you will, it will rain that day. It will come a lightning storm that day. And I pray that your horse's hooves begin to rot. And I pray that your horses will get the mange and the hair fall off of them. And you will have the most miserable day of your whole life. You know the reaction I got? <laughs> Guess what? That following Sunday, I went to church. I thought, ain't nobody will show up. Guess what? They all rode their horses to church. <laughs> True story. They rode their horses. I ain't got a problem with that. As long as they're in church on Sunday. <laughs> what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Well, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mm -hmm. This man used his property. The second man uh, used in verse 19, he said this. He said, another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. In other words, test them. I pray that he have me excused. Now, I know today nobody owns a set of oxen. My grandpa had a 10 or 12 team of oxen. I have a uh, brother's got a picture of it. And with my oldest uncle sitting in it in the early 1920s, early 1920s, and that is how they logged back then, was with a team of oxen. But we don't have oxen today, but many people will go out and purchase a dog for a pet or a cat. Or they'll go and they'll purchase a horse or maybe a mule or some goats or some sheep or cattle or whatever. Let me ask you, have you ever bought an animal without going to look at it first? I haven't either. Reminds me of these two old pipeliners years ago lived over there in Roan County and they was horse traders and they had uh, mules. And they began talking about their mules and how good they was and how well behaved they were and how good of a workers they were. And one said, my mules will outdo your mules. Hell, he said, no, my mules will outdo your mules. He said, well, why don't we just trade mules and find out? <laughs> well, yeah, I'll trade you my two mules for your two mules. So they lived on an old country gravel road and they each started walking their mules toward one another. And as they got closer and they, get, they realized that the mules that they was trading off was a little bit better than ones that they, they was getting. But all the mules was about lame. They was limping. They was probably old, had one foot, or I should say one hoof in the grave and another one on the banana peel. They was that old. And their ears was torn off where they'd fought. 
and, and they just traded an old set of mules for another set of mules. Listen, this individual used a lame excuse why he could not come, didn't he? So many of us. And this is where the material possessions come in too. Oh, I bought me a truck preacher and I got to go test that truck out before I come to church in it. You should have tested it out before you bought it. Amen? Amen. Oh, preacher, I just, uh, I can't leave that poor dog. I bought me a dog and it, it, it just messes in the house and I can't turn it out and I can't come to church. Put it on a leash! <laughs> and clean the mess up when you get home. Listen, we can come up with so many excuses why we shouldn't come to church and why we shouldn't get saved. The third man in verse 20, he said this, and another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. That sounds like that story I used on my wife here a while ago, didn't it? <laughs> Most of us have used our wives or our spouses for reasons why we just can't go nowhere, right? Matter of fact, they even use their spouses and children, as I said earlier, why they just can't come to church. One individual, this, one individual would say, say, well, well I just can't come to church because my wife don't come. I hear that a lot. Or my husband will come. And I don't want to leave them. I just, I just, I'll just wait on them to come. Guess what? If you wait until your spouse comes to church and, and hear the gospel, you'll never come to church. When the Lord tells you and lays it on your heart to get up and go to church, get up and go. When the Lord knocks on that heart's door, and he says, I want you to get saved today. You better get saved. Whether your spouse does or not. Because you may be the only example to lead that spouse to salvation. In Luke chapter 14 verse 33, it says this. Jesus said, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. Now he did not say, he that forsaketh not some of the things that he has, but he said all that you have. Let me ask you, how much do you love Jesus tonight? How much are you willing to serve him? How much are you willing to live for him? Are you willing to put him as the Lord of your life? Then you must forsake everything. He said, anyone who does not forsake everything that he has cannot be my disciple. If Jesus can't have all of you, he does not want part of you. And as little as I am, if he gets part, he gets almost nothing. Huh? But... So many people uses their family. You have to forsake your wife for Jesus' sake. You have to forsake your husband for Jesus' sake. You will have to forsake your children for Jesus' sake. And to flip that around, kids will have to forsake their parents for Jesus' sake. That's a hard truth, but it is the truth. Why do I have to forsake so much? Why do I have to give up so much? Why don't I just use an excuse? Because it's not acceptable. It's not. Let me ask you this. Have you ever realized how much Jesus Christ gave up to come to this earth? We haven't been to heaven yet. But Jesus Christ left all the glory that he shared with God the Father. Came to this old rotten earth that he created. And it was perfect when he created it. Man corrupted it. 
He came to this earth, clothed over his glory in a robe of flesh. Do you know why Jesus was born in the flesh? Do you know why God was born in the flesh? For one purpose, and that was to die. And he died. The Bible says he died for the sins of the whole world. Jesus forsook all that he had to save your soul and mine. So it's just a little thing that he asks us to forsake all to be his disciple. Amen? Amen. Tonight I want to look at a few things in the world's view as excuses and some things that I've ran into uh, as I had visited for several years. I want to give you about five or six excuses most people make. The first excuse that many people make is that a professing Christian in that church wronged me. They did me dirty. Have you all ever been done dirty? Every one of us has who's lived for the Lord. We even though we are born again, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and because of the covering of the blood of Christ, God looks down and sees that blood and sees us. We are an imperfect group of people. My answer to you is that if you're using an excuse that somebody had wronged you while you're staying out of church, and now why you're not getting saved? Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> Get tough. Get thick skin. Because you're going to always have that. Preachers has it worse than the congregation sometimes. Listen. We all have been wronged by a church member at one time or another. And so why should we use this as an excuse to go on unchurched and unsaved? Do you realize what you lose out on by using that as an excuse? You are losing out on your soul's salvation if you're lost. If you're saved and you use it as an excuse, you are losing out of the blessings that God wants to give you. Not only that, but you are losing out on the fellowship of the born-again Christians that love you and want a fellowship with you. You lose out on more ways than one. Some of these, now listen, note this. Some of these professing Christians that wrongs people in the church, they may not even be saved. The Bible says in the latter days, many will depart from the faith. Oh yeah, they'll have their name on the church roll. They'll stand up and profess that they're a Christian. They'll stand up and say, I love Jesus. But boy, you look at them, they, you, you just, it looks like they got a two for four crossways when you roll. It ought not to be, but it is. That's why I say, there are no perfect churches in this world. If you're waiting to find a perfect church to attend to, you'll never find one, and you'll never attend church. Well, what do you expect me to do? Go to church and do the best you can to make that church perfect. Be an example. Live for God. Live for Jesus Christ the way this book tells us to. Love your enemies. Pour coals of fire upon their heads. Kill them with kindness. And when you see them at Walmart, don't dart around and go to the other aisle. Just walk right straight down that aisle. Oh, hey, son, son, how are you? I better not move around too much. I will step on the phone. <laughs>
And besides this, one more thing concerning this before I move on. A professing Christian wronged me. Can I tell you if you're if you're born again and you use that as an excuse for not attending church, we go to church for Jesus' sake, not another individual's. Amen. Jesus died for my sake. And he died for your sake. And the least that we can do for him is to attend a worship service every Sunday. Amen? Amen? That's the least that we can do. It ain't the most that we can do. It's the least we can do. <clears throat> the second excuse that I've encountered is people say, I cannot forgive. I cannot forgive that individual. Then they'll look at me and say, well, preacher, you understand what I'm talking about, don't you? And I have to be honest and truthful. I have to say, no. Well, why not? Because God gave me a very short memory. I can't remember much things anymore. My wife says I have selective hearing and and a, and a want to forgetful memory. But listen, when I've been, I've been wrong in one particular church many, many, many years ago. And I have already forgiven them in my heart because that's what God expected me to do. Mm -hmm. An individual who was born again cannot stay mad at another believer or a church member. Because it'll eat at it, eat it, eat at his heart. It'll convict you of your of your wrongdoing, of your sin. And whenever I would see them, I would wave at them. I drive down the road and I meet them on the road and I'll put my hand up. Guess what? They don't wave. Meet them again. They don't wave. After a while, I thought, well, I'm going to try one more time. Here they come. Put my hand up. They wave. I about wrecked the truck and fell over and had a heart attack. <laughs> Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, talking about forgiveness, says this. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. When somebody really does you wrong, when somebody in the church really does something dirty to you, listen, we in our flesh, and the Apostle Paul says this about himself, we, listen, any good thing that I do, it's Christ in me that does it. And anything bad I do, it's me that does it. And so therefore... Concerning forgiveness, it is Christ in you that helps you to forgive. And it makes it a whole lot easier. Christ forgives and gives you the ability to forgive others. He, when you're born again, he gives you a new heart, a new attitude. A new perspective in life. He gives you everything you need to do what he expects of you to do. And that includes forgiving others. The third one. I like this one. The third one is that there's just too many hypocrites in that church. <laughs> Have y'all ever heard that? I got news for those people. There'll always be hypocrites in the church. Always. They was in the early church. All you have to do is go through the book of Acts and read about the hit. The church, like I said, there's no perfect church. And yet, people will just use that as an excuse. And millions of them uses it. 
Well, if so and so's a hypocrite, I ain't going there. Why, if God can save that individual, I ain't got a problem going to church. How many of y'all ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I ain't going to. I started to ask you how many of y'all made that excuse, but I ain't going to. That is true. Mm -hmm. Too many hypocrites in the church. Let me tell you this. <coughs> the hypocrites inside the church are not <coughs> born again. They're lost. They're unsaved. So many young people, so many young Christians, I mean, listen, if they're, if they're young Christians, they got you. They, they need to learn it, is that whether you are a young Christian at 80 years old or 20 years old or 10 years old, they're young and they need to learn. And we need to learn that everybody in the church is not saved. And yes, there'll be hypocrites in the church. Don't go to hell. Listen to me. Do not go to hell because of the hypocrites. Because that will not excuse you to go to heaven. We all have to give ourselves an account to God. Ourselves alone. Romans chapter 14 verse 12 says this. So then, every one of us shall give an account to himself, to God. <clears throat> That's going to be too far. First, I want to get on you believers. Do you realize, as a believer, and you wrong somebody, you'll be held accountable for it? <clears throat> If you will not forgive somebody, you'll be held accountable for it. God writes everything down. He keeps an accurate record. And if we don't ask for forgiveness from the other people and forgive them and forget, ask God to forgive us, if we ask Him to forgive us when we do all the right, He'll, he'll take that out. He'll blot it out. For believers, we're going to stand one day at the judgment seat of Christ. That judgment is not concerned whether we are going to heaven or going to hell. That judgment seat of Christ has a lot to do with after we are saved, the deeds and things done in the body. After we're saved. There'll be some people going around like the old saying goes doing the sniff test. Mike Richards, it smells like smoke. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> for the lost, there's going to be a judgment for you. One day, after a seven-year tribulation is over, there'll be something... There'll be a judgment called the Great White Throne Judgment. Believers will not be at that judgment. Only the lost will be at that judgment. The Bible says that, that everywhere in the world, whether it be in the sea, the graves, regardless where they're at, all of the lost will be gathered up together for that judgment. And the Bible says the books will be opened. What's in those books? It is their works. And then there'll be another book open. What's that book? That's called the book of life. And you will be held accountable of the deeds done in your body, the sins that you have committed, and the rejections of Jesus Christ that you've done so many times, and the excuses that you have put forth by not receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. Some people will burn harder in hell than others. 
And the Bible says that whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire. You mean there just might possibly be a chance that somebody could be found written in the Lamb's Book of Life at the Great White Throne Judgment? Nope. Not one name will be there. He just does that just to satisfy them. And prove to them their name's not there. All right, I'll get off the hypocrite yet. I could preach on that all night. Another excuse I've come across is that when I can live the Christian life, then I'll be saved. I wish I had a daughter every time I heard that. I'd be a rich man. Let me give you a little secret advice. If you think that you one day you might be able to live the Christian life and then get saved, <coughs> guess what? It cannot be done! It cannot be done. You come to Jesus Christ as you are. <coughs> just like that old gospel hymn we sing, just as I am without one plea. You cannot make yourself any better or any little bit more lovable to come and get saved. You come. You come with the dirt. You come with the grime. You come with the grace. You come with the sins. And you lay them all down at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, I'm not worthy, but will you please save? The Christian life is not like a water speaking. You turn it on one day and turn it off the next. Mm -hmm. A Christian life is a growing process. I've heard so many young people say, how many of y'all have when you was little, real little, like these girls, and say, boy, I can't wait to be a grown up one day. <laughs> oh, I wish I could be a grown up. And then after we got grown up, boy, I wish I was a child again. <laughs> I can, you can be a child at 10 years old, get saved, and you can turn 90 years old. And a mature, devout Christian, and guess what? You are still growing. And you will continue to grow until the Lord calls you home. It is a growing process. We learn to ask forgiveness of our mistakes. We, you know, when we, uh, well, I'm the reason a lot of these people say that when I can live the Christian life, I'll get saved, is because some of them don't want to make a mistake. Well, guess what? You're going to make mistakes. Yeah. Me, is there any perfect Christians here? <laughs> Whew, I'm glad you didn't raise your hand. I was going to preach another sermon. But uh, ain't none of us perfect. How many of y'all ever made mistakes in your Christian life? I have to raise my two hands and my feet. I make a lot of them. And I still do. Amen. But, guess what? We learn from those mistakes. And by making mistakes, guess what it does? It matures us. It's just like a little child. It's just like a little child Whenever we grew up, we had a wood hot stove. And mom and dad say, oh, no, don't touch that. Burn, baby, burn. Well, that's just telling the kid to go ahead and touch it. <laughs> and what did this stupid idiot do? I went over there and laid my hand on the stove. Ah! You learn by your mistake. From that mistake of touching that hot stove, guess what? 
I never touch it again. We learn from our mistakes. We grow from our mistakes. We mature from our mistakes. And guess what? We can teach others how to do the same. That's the purpose of having mistakes. You will never, you'll never be able to live the Christian life before you get saved. It comes after. Another one, another excuse is, preacher, not now. I'll get saved when I'm ready. I'll get saved when I'm ready. When the invitation comes and the Lord knocks on your heart's door, it's ready. You don't decide when you're going to get saved. You get saved when God calls you to get saved. You get saved. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, let me tell it to you this way. Turn over to uh, Acts chapter 24. This is interesting. If you want to turn there, you can listen to me. Acts chapter 24. The apostle Paul was speaking to Felix the governor about his soul salvation. And in verses 24 and 25, Felix said this. And, well, wait a minute. Oh, okay. Acts chapter 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife through Salem, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Do you realize there was nowhere in Scripture that indicates that Felix had called for Paul? There's nowhere in Scripture that Felix had ever got saved. You do not get saved on your own terms. You get saved on God's terms. They're written in this book. You don't get saved whenever you feel like getting saved or when you're ready to get saved. You're saved, you get saved when Jesus calls you, when the invitation is given. That's the time for you to get saved. The Bible says... Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Don't spurn the invitation. Don't spurn the rejection of Jesus Christ. Let's look at verses 21 through 24. I'm going to read this. So that, so that servant came after they made their excuses. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, and I want you to notice, the master of the house was angry. Was angry. The master here in this parable is God the Father. God gets angry when we look him in the eye and make out an excuse why we can't get saved. You might say, well, preacher, I never looked at God in the eye. I looked at you in the eye or somebody else in the eye. You look at those, you look at God. Listen, God gets angry when we come up with excuses why we can't come to church or why we can't get saved. And his anger boils over. And I often wonder, I wonder how many, how much he gets so angry at the New Testament church today. Think about that. Make it a little bit more personal. Ask yourself, Lord, did you get angry with me today over anything? I 
I bet none of us have ever asked God that, have we? You ought to try it sometime and see what the answer may be. And here after he got angry, he said, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Who are these individuals in the hedges and the byways and the bushes? It's the Gentiles. That's you and me. See, the invitation was first given to the nation Israel. But if you would go through the, through the beginning of the trials of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, you'll find out they made every excuse why they couldn't believe on Jesus as the Messiah. And they convicted him and they put him on a cross and murdered him. And as a nation, a nation as a whole rejected the invitation that was given to them. And so therefore, the invitation had been spilled out to the individuals that was less honorable than the Israelites. Well, what do you say? We're less honorable than Israel? Yeah. Israel was the apple of God's eye. We are the main, we are the halt, we are the crippled, we are the poor, we are the ones in the bushes. And he says, go and compel them to come in. And he brought some in. He said, the Lord house is still full. Or that there's still more room. Can I tell you that in this revival meeting tonight, we've had a good crowd here tonight. But yet, you look at the empty seats. There's still room. And Jesus Christ is telling the church to go out and compel them to come in. He decides to use you and me to go out and witness and save them and, and, and tell the church lost about the salvation of Jesus Christ and compel them to come into the church. In verse 24, in verse 24, I want you to notice this. He said, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. What does that mean? That means this, is that those who reject and continue to reject the invitation of Jesus Christ of being saved will themselves one day be rejected. There is a stopping point with God. There's not a stopping point with us, but there is a stopping point with God. You can reject God for so long and He's just going to put you down as a reprobate. He's going to put you down Lost forever. When that happens, your heart will grow colder, your heart will grow harder, and the gospel message will have no effect on you. And I'm going to tell you that is a very sad condition for anybody to be in. But there are many people in that condition today. Many. Let me ask you tonight. If you're here tonight and you're lost, do you find yourself getting a little colder in the heart? Do you find yourself getting just a little harder in the heart because you continue to say not now? 
because you continue of rejecting Jesus Christ for salvation. One day you continue to do that. God says, enough's enough. And you'll spend eternity in hell. I want to give you one more last, the last excuse. I'm not ready to close. And I've heard, and I love this excuse because it comes straight from the heart. It comes from an individual who has been done a lot of bad things in their life. And they know they're lost. They know they're going to hell. And they know that they need to be saved. And this is their excuse. I don't think Christ will forgive or receive me for all of the things that I have done. I love hearing that excuse because I can tell them through the scriptures that God forgives every sin. Amen. Every sin God will forgive. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 it says the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. Not some sin, all sin. Can I tell you, we have a lot of people in this world today who are living in adultery. God will forgive you of that. We have a lot of people in this world that is addicted to drugs and alcohol. God will forgive you of that. We have many people living a very indecent lifestyle. Men with men, women with women. God will forgive you of that and will put in you a clean heart. A heart that will love everybody. A heart that will forgive everybody. A heart that makes all things new. He'll save your soul for eternity. There's a story I want to share with you. Many years ago, back in the early 1900s, maybe, a preacher by the name of Charles G. Finney. How many people's heard of Mr. Finney? Back at that time, he was a remarkable, uh, remarkable preacher and also an evangelist. He went from town to town to town and preached the gospel. He went to places where no other preacher would go to in America at that time and preached the gospel. He was holding a, a, a revival meeting in this city somewhere on the East Coast. And there was a man there in an overcoat and a hat that came up to him at the church door as he was getting ready to walk in. And he pecked him on the shoulder and he said, Are you Mr. Feeney, the evangelist? He said, Yes, I am. He said, After you preach tonight, I want you to come home with me and talk to me. Mr. Feeney said, I will do that. You stand here and I'll, when I come out, I'll go home with you. So after the revival service was over and the, and the deacons and the people who was there at that point in time heard what that man said. So what did that man say to you? Mr. Finney said, well, he just asked me to go home with him and talk to him. Oh, don't do that. He is an ungrateful wretch. He and asked Mr. Finney to sit down. And he took out a gun and aimed it. He said, Mr. Finney, 
You think God can save a man like me? And he quoted in that bottom part of verse 7. Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth you from all sin. He said, let me tell you what I've done. And he set the gun down on his desk. And he said, I was in another town. I met this girl. And I lied to her about my occupation. Told her I was a well-do businessman. We got married quickly and came back. I lied to her. I own this beer establishment that we're in. He said, can a man say, can God save a man like me? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin, is what he said. He said, Mr. Finney, I come home drunk. I've cheated on my wife with other women. I have done so many terrible things. Men would come in and I would take their money and I would cheat them out of their money playing cards and the roulette tables and things of that nature and, and, and drink the watered down alcohol. He said, I've had wives coming in begging me to give their husbands back some of that money so that they could eat and I refused to do so. <clears throat> Can God save a man like me? He quoted that verse again. Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. He said, Mr. Minnie, I come home one evening. I was in a drunken rage. I beat my wife. I even beat her little girl. And I was in such a drunken rage that I didn't know what I was doing. And I throwed my little girl up against a hot iron stove. And she's burned so bad that she'll never recover. And she's scarred for life. Is there a hope for a man like me? Mr. Finney said, Jesus Christ, God's Son, forgives us from all sin. He said, thank you. And let Mr. Meany go home. That night, he went downstairs in that establishment of his, looked around at the tables, the card tables, the roulette wheel, all of that stuff, and the alcohol, and the whiskey bottles across the bar. And he began to go in a rage. And he overturned the tables, broke every whiskey bottle, tore the place completely apart and set it on fire. When he got home, his wife heard him come through the door and she was scared because it was kind of late. The daughter was still up. And he heard, she heard him go upstairs. And she looked at the daughter and she said, Daughter, go tell daddy his supper's on the table. The daughter really didn't want to go. But because mama asked, she went. A few minutes passed and nobody came downstairs. She got worried about her daughter. So the mother went upstairs and went into the bedroom. And lo and behold, her husband was on his knees hugging that little girl, crying his eyes out. And the wife was perplexed and she didn't know what to think. And he saw his wife standing there staring. And he said, honey, I'm so sorry for the misery that I put you through. But you'll never go through that again because God 
and brought you home a new husband and a new dad. That's what God does. God forgives. Amen. Excuses does not go well with God. Let me ask you this. What excuse are you willing to give tonight not to be saved? What excuse are you willing to give not to be saved? Again, we are without excuse is what the Bible says. If you're here tonight as a believer and you've used excuses for not coming to church, I want to invite you, believer, to come and lay those excuses at Jesus' feet. And get yourself right with God tonight. Sinner, lost person, I want to invite you to come and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Know that He died for you. Know that your sins can be forgiven. Know that you'll have a home that is eternal in the heavens. Will you please come? In Romans chapter 10, I'm going to read this. Very familiar passage for many people. But in Romans chapter 10, and this is for those who don't really know how to be saved. Romans chapter 10, 10 starting at verse 9, says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And in verse 13, applies to everybody. Amen. For whosoever Amen. shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for this message. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the listeners. Lord, I pray that if these people here tonight that is giving out excuses, whether it's to not to come to church or not to be saved. Lord, reveal to their heart through the conviction of the Holy Spirit that they are without excuse. And today, tonight, is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Sister, what are we singing? 313. 313. Jesus paid it all.